Hi, today's lecture about cerebral palsy and other neuromuscular conditions. A good source you can use is this book written by myself, The Guide to Pass Final Orthopedic Exam. Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a very common condition. That's why it comes frequently in the exams. What is the definition of cerebral palsy? What does it mean to say that someone has cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy is a non-progressive injury to the growing brain resulting in motor affection. So what does this exactly mean? First, it's a non-progressive injury. So that injury that happened cannot be a progressive. It cannot be a tumor. It's a non-progressive injury. So it is an a one insult that happened to the brain and then resolved. For example, ischemia, ischemic attack that happened to the brain and then resolved, or uh, uh, some hemorrhage that happened to the brain and that re and then resolved, or an infection uh, that uh, affected the brain and then later on resolved. It. So it's a non-progressive injury. So this is number one. It's a non-progressive injury to the growing brain. What does it mean? Growing brain means. Uh, before birth, at birth, or shortly after birth, usually we say the first one or two years after birth. So it's a non-progressive injury to the growing brain. And then the last uh, thing that, require, that comes from that definition is resulting in motor affection. So that injury that happened to the brain should result in some, new, um, in some mus uh, motor affection and musculoskeletal manifestation. So if it, for example, uh, the injury resulted in pure uh, uh, speech uh, injury or um, affected only vision uh, that is not considered cerebral palsy so cerebral palsy the injury and the insult has to result in some motor affection there has to be a musculoskeletal manifestation of the a brain injury. I'd like to say something here. So the, the cerebral palsy is a non-progressive injury. The injury itself is non-progressive. However, uh, the musculoskeletal manifestation of the cerebral palsy can be progressive. So uh, the, the manifestation of the disease, the spasticity, the subluxation, the dislocation, uh, the ability to walk, all these can be progressive. But the injury itself to the brain is a non-progressive injury. So it's a non-progressive injury to the growing brain resulting in motor affection. That's the definition of cerebral palsy. One of the common schools of cerebral palsy is intrauterine ischemia. Uh, and the intrauterine ischemia usually gives uh, what we call uh, periventricular leukomalacia. So if you hear uh, this expression, uh, periventricular leukomalacia, uh, it, um, uh, uh, it means a white matter around the ventricles, uh, as you can see here. So the periventricular leukomalacia, um, it is um, uh, one uh, manifestation of cerebral palsy that is usually due to intrauterine brain ischemia. So if the cause of cerebral palsy is intrauterine ischemia, which is actually one of the most common cause of cerebral palsy. If you do a, an MRI of the brain for these children, uh, you will find white matter around the ventricle, which we call periventricular leukomalacia. So what are the types of cerebral palsy? According to the types of uh, muscle affection, uh, the cerebral palsy can be classified into spastic, acetoid, uh, less common types, ataxic, hypotonic, or combined. Uh, by far the most common is the spastic cerebral palsy in which there's an increased uh, tone in the muscle. Uh, spasticity is increased tone that is rate limited, meaning that if you move the muscle quicker, uh, the muscle um, uh, tone will increase more. Uh, so spastic is the most common type of cerebral palsy. Uh, uh, Athetoid uh, comes after that. Uh, Athetoid, sometimes called dyskinetic uh, cerebral palsy, it means that the child has abnormal motion. The most common type of this abnormal motion is the dys, uh, dystonia. Uh, so uh, athetoid uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is the second most common type of uh, cerebral palsy in which there is abnormal motion. And in general, tendon transfers are not predictable in athetoid cerebral palsy. So if you have a child that is mainly athetoid cerebral palsy, uh, be aware that tendon transfer results are not predictable. Uh, it's not, does not work as good as in spastic. So we have the spastic athetoid, which is dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Um, uh, it has uh, abnormal motion. The most common of these is the dystonia. Uh, other uh, less common type, the ataxic, the hypotonic, and uh, uh, combined type. The other classification of the cerebral palsy is the uh, a classification according to the parts of the body affected to diaplegic, hemiplegic, and quadriplegic. The diaplegic cerebral palsy, the four limbs are affected. However, uh, it mainly affects the uh, lower extremity much more than the upper extremity. 
Uh, and uh, one of the most common types of uh, cerebral palsy is the spastic diaplegia, meaning that uh, according to the tone, uh, the child has a spasticity, and according to the distribution, it is diaplegic, meaning it affects uh, uh, the uh, lower extremity much more than the upper extremity. Um, and this is usually related to uh, prematurity and low birth weight. So again, spastic diaplegia, one of the most common uh, forms of cerebral palsy. There are many surgeries that are designed for that. Um, spasticity uh, is the type of tone according to the classification. Diaplegia means affecting mainly the lower extremity much more than the upper extremity. Uh, and uh, it is related to prematurity and low birth weight and ischemia. So this is uh, the spastic diaplegia. Hemiplegic type, uh, this means that uh, there is uh, one side of the body is affected uh, more than the other. And usually the hemiplegic usually uh, affect the upper extremity uh, more than the lower uh, extremity. Um, in these patients with uh, with hemiplegic cerebral palsy, you may find a mild equinus in the uh, unaffected side. Uh, it is this is mainly for compensation, and you don't need to, to address it when you do surgery. Quadriplegic cerebral palsy. This means affection of the four extremities, um, uh, marked affection of the four extremities. That what we call quadriplegic cerebral palsy. So in this picture, you can see this is one of my patients with quadriplegic cerebral palsy. See affection of both lower extremity and severe affection of upper extremity. So this is not diaplegic cerebral palsy. This is severe affection of the four extremities and it's called quadriplegic cerebral palsy. And this is also a picture of one of my patients. This is diaplegic cerebral palsy. So there is mainly affection of the lower extremity. If you can see, there is some affection of the upper extremity but the patient is able to use a walker and he is able to uh, uh, use his upper extremity better so despite there is mild affection of the upper extremity it affects more the lower extremity according to the severity the cerebral palsy has uh, the classification of the gm fcs which is gross motor function uh, classification system uh, this is a functional classification system as the name implies um, and it is uh, five levels so level one the child basically move with no limitation uh, 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 level two the child has uh, some limitation uh, he may also use a brace, uh, AFO, ankle foot orthosis, uh, but um, the limitations are not severe. Uh, level uh, three is uh, the kid use assistive device. Uh, it may be a cane or uh, crutches in most cases. Um, he may use the wheelchair, um, uh, but in most of the time he uh, can use the um, uh, crutches or a cane. Uh, level four is more affection, so the child can take few steps with a walker. Um, he can also uh, ambulate um, an electric wheelchair. Um, so there is some self-mobility, uh, but uh, not as a grade three. So uh, grade one, no limitation. Grade two, uh, mild limitation. Uh, grade three, um, um, walk uh, with assistive device like uh, 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 crutches. Um, uh, for um, the child has some uh, self mobility so he can uh, walk with a walker or can uh, operate um, a wheelchair electric wheelchair um, uh, gm fcs4 basically mean wheelchair bound uh, the child has to be um, in a wheelchair and someone push the wheelchair one of the important thing in the exam of patient with cerebral palsy is to differentiate if the stiffness is coming from a muscle that uh, passes two joints or one joint, what we what we call biarticular and monoarticular uh, muscles. Why? Because that's important if you decide to give Botox or uh, do muscle release, as we're going to see later on. Um, so there are two important tests that I would like you to know uh, to differentiate between um, uh, the type of contracture if it's coming from a muscle that crosses two joint or one joint. Uh, the one that is extremely important and it's not only in cerebral palsy, you will use it um, in basically uh, uh, most of uh, other uh, uh, subspecialities like uh, foot and ankle and trauma, is the silver sky test. Uh, the silver squid test is basically when you have a patient with equinus, you want to know if that equinus is coming from the uh, uh, gastrocnemius muscle, which uh, go uh, through two joints, the knee 
and the ankle, so it's a biarticular, or it's coming from the soleus uh, uh, muscle, uh, or basically soleus and the gastrocnemius, meaning that the, the Achilles tendon itself, which is the combination of the soleus and the gastrocnemius, is tight. The silver scoid test is you assess the dorsiflexion with the knee extended and with the knee flexed. So when, with the knee flexed, you're basically uh, um, relaxing the, uh, gas, uh, the gastrocnemius muscle uh, and you're mainly testing the uh, Achilles tendon and the soleus muscle. Uh, and if, uh, if you notice that uh, there is marked dorsiflexion obtained, like there is more than 15 degrees that you were able to obtain and you basically Basically, we're able to obtain a normal uh, dorsiflexion. That means that the problem in the gastrocnemius muscle. So you first assess the dorsiflexion with the knee extended. Uh, basically, uh, that will put the gastrocnemius muscle under tension, and then you repeat the same maneuver with the knee flexing. If you see a big difference, more than 15 degree, that tells you that the gastrocnemius muscle, which comes above the knee, uh, is responsible for this uh, 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 for this uh, equation and when you uh, release it may be sufficient just to release the gastrocnemius muscle so a gastrocnemius muscle is biarticular it will cross um, the knee and the ankle it will become uh, tight uh, with the knee extension uh, and that will pull the ankle into plantar flexion and uh, decrease the dorsiflexion uh, so um, uh, if when the knee is extended you will have less dorsiflexion when the knee is flexed you will have more dorsiflexion if the difference is more than 15 degree that indicate that the gastrocnemius muscle is uh, basically the muscle that is responsible for that equinus and releasing this muscle or botox of this muscle by itself will be enough if you find that dorsi the dorsiflexion is limited in both uh, knee extended and knee flexed, that tells you that the soleus also is contracted and the whole tendon, Achilles tendon, is contracted, and it may be easier to work on the Achilles, or it may be more efficient to work on the Achilles tendon itself and not on the gastrocnemius muscle. Uh, another test is important in cerebral palsy. It may not be used with other uh, branches. Is the Duncan Ellie test, and basically uh, for kids uh, who have limited knee flexion, so their problem is basically limited knee flexion. You want to know if it's coming from the uh, 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 from the whole quadriceps muscle or only from the rectus. Remember, uh, vastus medialis, lateralis, and intermedius. They all come uh, distal to the hip joint. However, the rectus which comes from the um, uh, anterior inferior iliac spine is biarticular. It crosses the hip joint and it crosses the knee joint. Uh, so um, with the hip extended, the rectus is definitely under uh, more tension and then uh, you will bend the knee. Uh, if you were able to bend the knee but the hip comes up, that tells you that the, gas, the rectus is the responsible muscle because the only way to flex the knee and, uh, and stretch the quadriceps muscle is to bend the hip uh, 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 to relax the rectus. So that tells you that bending, uh, bending the knee or flexing the knee requires the hip to flex, which basically requires the rectus uh, uh, femoris muscle uh, to relax. So that tells you that the contracture that this patient or the limited uh, flexion that uh, this patient is having is due to uh, the rectus muscle and not to the rest of the quadriceps muscle. Another important biarticular muscle is the hamstring muscle. The hamstring muscles uh, crosses both the hip joint and uh, the uh, knee uh, joint. It causes extension of the hip and uh, flexion of the knee. So uh, the measurement uh, of the hamstring contraction is done by something called the popliteal angle. In the popliteal angle, the child is supine and then the hip is flexed 90 degree, which puts stretch on the hamstring muscle. And then you assess um, the amount of the flexion contraction that this patient had which is basically this angle here between the uh, lower leg and the vertical uh, so uh, that if there is a hamstring contracture as you can uh, as in most cases of um, cerebral palsy there will be limited knee extension with the hip flexed 90 degree so with the hip flexed 90 degree there will be limited hip uh, limited knee extension and this angle here the lack of extension is called the popliteal angle One of the most important thing in cerebral palsy and the family is going to ask you is this child is going to walk or not?
So the most important prognostic sign for the ability of a ch <clears throat> young child with cerebral palsy to walk is his ability to sit independently by the age of two. So if you have a kid with cerebral palsy that uh, was able to sit before sit independently, meaning that he can sit, you can leave him on the uh, uh, examination table uh, for a few seconds and he does not lean to the right or left, uh, that um, a child most probably, if he can do that by the age of two years, he's able to walk. Um, other prognostic factor is standing by the age of four uh, and walking by the age of eight. So uh, usually if the kid with cerebral palsy is going to walk, um, usually he can be a standing by the age of four and uh, by the age of eight, if the patient is not able to walk, his ability uh, for future walking is uh, very minimal. So uh, sitting independently by the age of two years is a, a most prognostic sign for the patient ability to walk, also standing by the, um, unsupported by the age of four. And usually if the kid is going to walk, they do this before the age of eight. So let's speak about gait and cerebral palsy in more details. So um, kids with cerebral palsy have uh, a, a abnormal gait or deviation of the gait from the normal and this is due to primary anomalies, secondary anomalies and tertiary anomalies as we're going to explain. The primary anomalies in the, um, that uh, causes disturbance of the gait and cerebral palsy is basically what is directly related to the injury of the central nervous system, uh, like um, lack of a selective muscle control. And this is more in the distal than in the proximal. So most of the kids with cerebral palsy will have more control of their proximal muscle, like the thigh and the shoulder, more than they have in the ankle and the wrist. Uh, also, they depend on primitive reflexes for, ambu uh, for ambulation. They have abnormal muscle tone, as we dis uh, discussed before. Um, and uh, there, is, uh, there is also imbalance between agonist and antagonist. Uh, so, for example, they may fire both agonist and antagonist when they're walking. Uh, they may be firing both, for example, uh, uh, the quadriceps and the hamstring. And uh, uh, they also have a uh, deficient in equilibrium, which affect their balance. Also, there is secondary anomaly, so primary anomaly due to the injury to the neuromuscular. The secondary anomaly due to abnormal muscle and bone growth. So the musculoskeletal manifestations of the injury is the cause of the secondary anomaly. The child will have progressive skeletal deformity. There is progressive hip subluxation, as we're going to see when we discuss the hip and cerebral palsy. There is torsional development deformity of the bone, the kids get uh, excess femoral antiversion, there is foot deformities, all this is a progressive skeletal deformity and of course there is soft tissue deformity, M uh, uh, most of these kids will develop muscle uh, contracture and joint contracture. Also, there is tertiary abnormalities, um, and this is include the coping mechanism. So, for example, children uh, with equinus, uh, sometimes they will walk in equinus like this and you'll be able to see it, or sometimes they will actually um, have the equinus here, the patient will put the whole foot and get knee hyperextension. So um, uh, uh, the tertiary uh, 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 abnormalities that will happen in, uh, in gait uh, in the cerebral palsy are usually proximal because as we know that the kids have more selective uh, control of their mo proximal muscle than their distal muscle. Uh, so uh, for example, child has an equinus, he can uh, circumdict the hip. So there will be hip circumduction uh, only because the child want to uh, clear the foot from the floor uh, or uh, for also another example, if there's an equinus, instead of walking in equinus, uh, the child will proceed to hyperextension of the knee so that he, he or she can put the full foot on the floor. So crouch gait is a very important concept in cerebral palsy. It is common in diaplegic cerebral palsy. What does it mean, crouch gait? Crouch gait means that the child walks with hip flexed and the knee flexed. This will make the center of the patient's, uh, uh, the uh, center of the body mass um, is over the foot, so it gives them stability that helps them in walking. So the crouch gait is common in diaplegic cerebral palsy. Uh, however, this type of gait is energy consuming and in general, orthopedic surgeons always try to uh, correct the crouch gait so that children can walk better. Uh, it is, as I said, hip flexion, knee flexion. Regarding the ankle, it can be either in equinus or calcaneous deformity. Like in this example, the patient actually has ankle dorsiflexion, so it's more of a calcaneous position rather than equinus. So not um, all kids with crouch gait has equinus. Uh, some of them has actually a calcaneous deformity, and you need to examine every child. So hip flexion, knee flexion, deformity.
Here is a picture from my book, um, a Pediatric Orthopedic uh, for Primary Care. You can see a patient here with a spastic diaplegia, has a crouch gait, she, uh, she has a hip flexion, if you can see, and knee flexion. Uh, in the ankle here, so there is some equinus and also there is forefoot abduction uh, and vulgus deformity. So um, you see here uh, there is a, a, a flexion of the hip and flexion of the knee. So this is an example here of a patient with crouch gait. You can see he has hip flexion, knee flexion. The uh, ankle is in calcaneous deformity. Um, you can see the patient here walking, knee, flex, uh, knee flexion and hip flexion, and the ankle is in calcaneous deformity. This is what we call crouch gait. This is another example here of a patient with crouch gait. Uh, I want to see you the hip flexion. So there is hip flexion here and there is knee flexion. Um, and see uh, that uh, this crouch gait hey, you want to go? Uh, oh, energy consuming. Uh, so the patient is walking with the crouch gait that I told you about and uh, as I said not uh, all kids with the crouch gait have equinus actually a significant part of them has calcaneous deformity so let's go now to spasticity of the cerebral palsy remember we said that types of tone in cerebral palsy is either spasticity or ataxic or um, uh, athetoid or a hypotonia or mixed spasticity is the most common so spasticity is the most common tone abnormality in cerebral palsy what does it mean spasticity it is increase in resistance um, and this increase in resistance um, is uh, dependent on the speech so it's velocity dependent so if you remember from your medical school there was something called rigidity like in in, uh, in parkinsonism and the rigidity um, which is also increased tone is not speed um, uh, is not velocity dependent meaning that um, uh, whether you bend the knee um, uh, fast or um, uh, slow the tone in the muscle is not going to to change but spasticity um, the, the tone will increase um, with the increasing the speed of the stretch so for example you have the knee and you bend the knee uh, quickly um, in this case you're stretching the uh, quadriceps muscles quickly so the the um, spasticity will show up uh, uh, more or uh, you're trying to uh, to extend the knee in this case you are um, uh, stretching the uh, hamstring muscle and um, so if you stretch the knee quickly um, the, the, the the spasticity will increase and the tone in the muscle will increase Con uh, clonus is a common um, uh, finding associated with spasticity we have two examples here uh, for clonus in my patients you can see here um, uh, uh, we um, dorsiflexing the ankle uh, and uh, with dorsiflexion of the ankle uh, the um, muscles will start um, uh, firing and you can see the clonus here is also another example so you quickly um, dorsiflex the ankle and you will find there is a clonus meaning that uh, there is repeated um, uh, uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion um, here like quick if you do quick uh, dorsiflexion you will find the clonus as you can see here um, and usually um, the spasticity uh, is a consequence of injury to the white matter of the brain so we talked about the spasticity um, and let's now talk about the management of spasticity spasticity as we said is the most common tone change in cerebral palsy um, so there are um, first we start with local treatment to prevent the spasticity from becoming muscle contraction so spasticity as we said is increased muscle tone however if you leave that increased muscle tone without treatment it will result in contraction the contracture is different than spasticity is that it becomes fixed deformity now so you cannot overcome that uh, uh, contracture if it already ha happened so if you have a for example a spasticity of um, uh, for example the gastrocnemius muscle for a long time it can result in fixed equinus contracture so what do we do we start with muscle stretching so you stretch the muscles that are tight uh, physical therapy and bracing bracing is very important so um, we recommend in most cases for these uh, patient if they have tight um, gastrocnemius to sleep uh, and go to school with some form of uh, ankle foot orthosis and um, if you notice that they are getting a knee contracture they can sleep with um, uh, a knee immobilizer in fixed in extension so bracing is uh, used when uh, spasticity did not result in contracture of the joint yet uh, to prevent that contracture from happening another local measure which we're going to talk in, about in the next slide is botox injection 
So uh, the Botox is actually uh, the botulinum A uh, toxin manufacturer. So this is uh, the Botox uh, is the botulinum A toxin. How does this work? Um, uh, first, let's review how does the nerve impulse uh, result in the muscle contracture, uh, contraction. Uh, this happens uh, 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 by the, um, uh, the nerve impulse will result in release of the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine will cross the nerve muscle uh, interface and um, uh, uh, result in the um, uh, contraction of the muscle. So the Botox or the botulinum toxin work by irre um, uh, irreversible binding to the presynaptic acetylcholine release. It's the presynaptic, so it's in, in the nerve impulse. It blocks the uh, acetylcholine vesicle um, uh, uh, irreversible uh, release. Uh, despite irreversible blocking, so um, if the uh, botulinum um, uh, now uh, uh, becomes attached to this vesicle, it will become permanently uh, or irreversible blocking of this vesicle to release the acetylcholine. However, it only works for six months. Why? Because the nerve impulse and the nerve endings will form new um, uh, synaptic vesicles. So um, it works um, uh, despite its irreversible blockage, so it does not like block and then remove. No, it becomes, it attaches to the uh, to the vesicle and um, it, uh, it prevent that vesicle from release um, irreversible. However, uh, there will be new vesicle uh, formed. Uh, so after about six months, that effect uh, will be uh, terminated. So um, the Botox is the botulinum A toxin. It works by irreversible, irreversible blocking of the presynaptic um, pre acetylcholine. It only works for six months because the nerve impulse will form new um, acetylcholine uh, uh, vesicles. Uh, to treat uh, spasticity systemically, uh, one of the um, methods that we can use is the baclofen. Uh, the baclofen um, it can be oral or intrathecal baclofen is basically a muscle relaxant that works uh, on the nervous system. Uh, as we said, it can be taken systemically by oral or it can be intrathecal. Intrathecal, it means that the medication is going to be delivered um, in the CSF by intrathecal uh, bump. Um, uh, so uh, the medication uh, will be basically in a reservoir. The reservoir is usually in the patient's abdomen, so that requires that the patient should have a um, certain uh, uh, weight to um, be able to have the bump uh, in their abdomen. Uh, a very uh, a thin patients, uh, especially those who have severe muscle spasticity and they are losing weight and they don't have enough uh, fat, it may be uh, hard to apply the bump in their abdomen. And then the uh, bump will have a catheter basically that uh, goes into the back and then goes into the CSF and deliver the medication directly to the uh, uh, CSF. Uh, remember uh, that uh, uh, this uh, method here uh, can sometimes, uh, if there is any disturbance in the delivery of the medication, can give you a baclofen withdrawal. The baclofen withdrawal happens if the mm, medication is not stopped uh, the, to be delivered to the uh, CSF. This can happen if the, basically the medication uh, is uh, finished from the bump or the bump is not working anymore or there is like um, uh, occlusion of the catheter. There are multiple um, reasons. Uh, all of them will result in in the baclofen not to be delivered in the CSF, and then the patient uh, will start having a baclofen withdrawal. The baclofen withdrawal symptoms is basically uh, 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 muscle spasticity, severe muscle spasticity that can be actually life-threatening. So baclofen with, uh, withdrawal, as we said, will cause severe muscle spasticity because you're giving a medication that's causing the muscle to be uh, 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 in a relaxation and then uh, you stop this medication so the muscle will go to severe spasticity. On the other hand, baclofen overdose will cause flaccidity so uh, the patient will have hypotonia and usually that manifests as the patient is not able uh, uh, to keep his um, head straight so the head will be falling. So uh, baclofen overdose those will lead to uh, flaccidity. So baclofen withdrawal is associated with um, uh, 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 severe spasticity and possibly convulsion. It's a life-threatening Back, um, baclofen overdose will lead to flaccidity. So there is a, a also a surgical management. So we talked about medical management. There is a surgical management of spasticity um, done by the neurosurgeon. 
um, the surgery is called selective dorsal rhizotomy or SDR. Selective dorsal rhizotomy is actually uh, uh, there um, uh, for each kid uh, with a cerebral palsy. There will be some uh, dorsal root that are responsible for the uh, uh, um, increased um, spasticity and um, with also with increased reflex. Uh, so it's so this surgery cuts actually the dorsal root. We all we also we all know that the dorsal root are actually sensory root. They are not motor root. However, uh, the uh, reflex and the uh, sensation goes through the dorsal root so this surgery will actually co um, cut the dorsal roots that are responsible for the um, increased muscle spasticity in the muscles that are affecting the patient uh, that's why we call it selective so it's not all the dorsal uh, roots and it's dorsal rhizotomy it's not ventral it's not uh, you do, uh, um, the motor roots are left intact it's the sensory it's the sensory or the dorsal root um, and it's part of the uh, reflex and part of the sensation so cutting these roots can decrease the spasticity um, it's not indicated for everyone it's usually indicated for patients with spastic diaplegia um, uh, that are uh, that has some mobility crouch gait and this as we said will result in permanent uh, decrease in the muscle tone so this is a permanent decrease in the muscle tone it's the dorsal root not the ventral root um, it's done it has the child has to have some sp uh, uh, ambulation it's more done in spastic diaplegic kids so now after we talked about spasticity we'll talk about affection of different parts of the body we'll start with the hip because basically this is the most important the hip in the cerebral palsy has something called subluxation when, which basically means that the head start to come out of the socket so the femoral head will come out of the socket um, this is a subluxation when it's completely out it's called dislocated um, the etiology of this is the muscle imbalance because the hip adductor in cerebral palsy the, um, the muscle that bring the uh, femur towards the midline is stronger than the abductor which brings the uh, shaft uh, uh, to the outside so when when the hip adductors are much stronger they pull the femur here towards the midline so the head will start going out it will start subluxating till it completely out and it becomes sub, um, dislocated uh, the clinical picture the condition is usually asymptomatic and that's why we do something called hip surveillance it basically means that you actively look for examine the hip and possibly get an x-ray to detect if there is any hip pathology uh, parents may complain uh, that the, uh, there is decrease in hip abduction of the um, uh, uh, so meaning that they, they cannot really spread the two thighs apart uh, so there is limited abduction um, uh, for example they want to change the diaper or uh, clean the perineum they will find difficulty in that uh, when the hip is uh, disloca uh, dislocated uh, and they actually may sometimes complain that the patient is in pain during um, uh, change uh, usually you have to ask them how do the uh, patient express pain in most of the cases it will be either um, uh, grimace or making uh, some uh, um, uh, voices uh, that the parent will know that he is in pain uh, so there will be some grimace when they start to um, uh, spread the legs apart um, uh, because uh, when the hip is subluxed or dislocated this motion may cause pain so uh, for hip affection and cerebral palsy, as we said, the, uh, the pathophysiology starts with um, a tight uh, hip adductor and tight hip flexor. That will result in uh, hip uh, adduction contraction and flexion contraction. Adduction contraction um, is easy to detect. Basically, you won't be able to spread the legs apart. Flexion contraction uh, is a slightly harder. Flexion contraction means that uh, uh, you cannot extend the hip all the way. But however, you, when you see the patient on the examining table or in the bed, uh, it may not be obvious why because the hip head uh, the patient has hyper um, uh, uh, lordosis um, basically with hyper lordosis he can bring back the um, legs to uh, the uh, resting position on the bed so how to detect that uh, you um, hyperflex uh, the other leg so when you hyperflex the, the, the other leg you obliterate the hyper lordosis and the flexion contracture will be obvious uh, the leg will be off the table and when you try to push 
push in the knee, you will not be able to get it fully extended. Another um, method to detect the flexion with rectures is called the Stahili test. And it's done with the patient in the prone position at the edge of the table. And then you let the leg uh, dangle and then you try to get it extended. One leg on the pelvis, one hand on the pelvis, the other one is try to extend as much as possible. And the amount lacking from full uh, uh, straight position is the flexion contraction. So the Stahili test and the Thomas test uh, are the two tests to detect the flexion contracture. Uh, the adduction contracture is much easier to detect. You won't be able just to spread the leg apart. Um, uh, in quadriplegic cerebral palsy uh, and uh, to less extent in diaplegic cerebral palsy, the natural history of this uh, abduction flexion contracture is that the hip will start to subluxate and then eventually it will uh, dislocate. Um, uh, so the hip will uh, start get, uh, with the abduction contracture and then it will start subluxating and then um, eventually it may uh, dislocate. This is much common in quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Uh, it still also can occur in diaplegic cerebral palsy. So um, what is the X-ray finding of subluxation? As we said, we need to, we need to do the surveillance, so we need to uh, actively look for uh, the hip uh, uh, subluxation. We use something called migration index. Migration index is basically the percentage of uncovered uh, head. Um, how do we do this? So this is uh, uh, the head of the femur, uh, and the percentage uh, uncovered is basically the percentage uh, of uh, the part of the head that is not covered with the acetabulum to the whole width of the head. So this is the whole width of the head, and this is the percentage of the uncovered part um, uh, of the head. So this part is not covered by the acetabulum, uh, and this is the whole uh, head, and we divide this part by this part. So if this percentage is uh, more than 30%, meaning that the uncovered part is more than 30% of the uh, femoral head, this requires uh, treatment and attention because uh, if left untreated, uh, it may progress into full dislocation. So if you see that there is a patient with cerebral palsy that is getting subluxation or the migration percentage index is getting uh, uh, bigger, uh, the first thing is you do is stretching. So stretching of which muscle? Basically, the hip adductor. We said that the pathology is starts with hip adductors and hip flexors um, tightening. So the first thing is physical therapy and stretching of the hip uh, adductors and um, hip flexors, meaning that you try to uh, abduct both sides to stretch the uh, hip uh, adductors. Um, also, Botox injection can be tried in, uh, in which muscle you will inject uh, uh, the hip uh, adductors, like the adductor longus and the bravus. Um, uh, if that doesn't work and the child is uh, at younger age, you don't want to do uh, uh, bony surgeries um, in young age, um, so you do surgical release of the hip uh, adductors and the hip flexors to allow the hip uh, to go back into position. So the soft tissue release, as we mentioned, is the release of the hip adductors and flexors. The adductor can be done uh, through a medial incision uh, or it can actually be done percutaneously. Um, the the uh, a surgeon feeds the adductor longus and release the adductor longus, possibly also release the bravus. Um, the the uh, flexors is the iliopsoas muscle. Um, uh, it can be done through um, a medial incision, um, uh, in which the case you release the adductor and then you go more deep and release the hip flexors. Um, uh, some surgeons now go more towards the uh, origin. Um, however, the uh, main idea is to release the hip flexor, the iliopsoas. So the uh, hip adductors, the hip uh, flexors are the um, uh, soft tissue release uh, for especially for younger kids. Uh, for older kids, a uh, bony procedure is preferred, and the bony surgery is various uh, derotation osteotomy. Um, so, uh, as you see, uh, these kids will have um, uh, increased valgus angle um, of the femoral uh, uh, neck. Uh, so, the surgery is to do a, a proximal femoral osteotomy, intertrochanteric. Um, and then uh, varus producing, so you put varus into the proximal femur uh, to get it more um, in, uh, contained into the acetabulum. Uh, then internal fixation, sometimes uh, this can be, uh, uh, if, the, if the subluxation is more, sometimes this can be combined with uh, some sort of pelvic osteotomy. However, if the dislocation has been going on for a long period, 
and um, uh, uh, you're not expecting good results with uh, containment, uh, uh, the option is femoral resection, proximal femoral resection. So basically, you remove the proximal femur completely. This procedure, the proximal femoral resection, is complicated usually by my proximal migration of the distal part uh, of the femur. Uh, so um, uh, some surgeons will, will do traction for a while, some surgeons will even put external fixator. Another option is to do a valgus osteotomy and uh, contain the lesser troch into the uh, uh, acetabulum and also you can even uh, suture uh, the um, uh, ligamentum teres here in the acetabulum into the iliopsoas attached here uh, to prevent the proximal migration. Uh, so here, this is one of my patient, long time uh, ephemeral head um, uh, uh, dislocation. Uh, patient is in lots of pain. The family tells you when they change the diaper, uh, the child uh, uh, show lots of uh, pain and grimace, and the child cannot sit for a long time in the chair. So um, what I did is I proximal femoral resection, as we said, and the um, uh, vulgus osteotomy with uh, suturing the uh, ligamentum teres to the lesser troch. Uh, this is called McHale procedure. Uh, it's not important the name, but the concept is proximal femoral resection for long-standing uh, dislocation uh, combined with a procedure to prevent migration. In this case, uh, uh, vulgus osteotomy uh, uh, added um, uh, to the procedure. So I just want to um, explain uh, this issue so you're not confused. So if you have a hip uh, subluxation or a very recent hip dislocation, like for example, you have been uh, doing surveillance for this patient and um, six months ago the hip were in and now they are um, subluxated or um, early dislocation, the treatment is to put the hip inside the socket by um, various osteotomy plus or minus pelvic osteotomy. However, if the hip has been dislocated for a long time, long time, years, and in this case, you do not reduce the hip into the socket, what you do is you do a hip excision of the proximal femur, um, uh, plus other procedure to prevent migration like valgus osteotomy. So subluxation or early dislocation, the treatment is reduction by um, varus osteotomy. Uh, long lasting dislocation, the treatment is uh, proximal femoral excision uh, plus other maneuvers to prevent uh, um, a migration proximally. So now after finishing the hip, let's speak about the knee and cerebral palsy. Uh, very commonly in cerebral palsy, the most common deformity is flexion contracture. Um, so the child will have um, uh, inability to extend the knee uh, uh, fully, as you can see here. Um, and you can see also here the knee is uh, severely flexed. Sometimes it goes beyond 90 degrees, affecting even the patient's ability to sit. And um, uh, we discussed before that we uh, to assist the uh, knee flexion contracture, we do something called the popliteal angle, uh, which is the angle between the tibia and the uh, vertical um, while extending uh, the knee. So for knee flexion contracture, uh, the classic is to do the uh, soft tissue release, uh, release, which is basically releasing the hamstring muscles, um, uh, plus or minus the posterior capsule if the um, the contracture is severe. Um, the other options, um, as we're going to see, you can do distal femoral osteotomy or guided growth of the anterior femur, as we're going to see later on. So the release, as we said, is for the um, uh, hamstring muscle, uh, which goes from the hip uh, to uh, distal to the knee. So release of the hamstring muscle plus or minus the posterior capsule if the contracture is severe. So soft tissue release involves release of the hamstrings, uh, whether a medial hamstring or medial and lateral hamstring, plus adding the posterior um, the capsular release of the knee so that we can get the uh, tibia to extend more. Another option uh, other than soft tissue release is to work on the uh, bony part, which is the distal femur. So there's two options uh, when it comes to the uh, bony distal femur operation. If the child is still growing, a uh, growth modulation procedure can be done, basically stopping the growth of the anterior uh, distal femur, allowing the uh, distal, uh, the posterior distal femur to grow and the femur to extend. Um, another option, if the, especially if the patient is done growing, is to do an acute distal femoral osteotomy, uh, which can be, of course, combined with uh, distalization of the tibial tubercle to give uh, the uh, quadriceps muscle uh, more uh, power. 
So this is the clinical picture of one of my patients. Uh, he has bilateral uh, uh, knee affliction contracture. Uh, so we did a distal femoral osteotomy. Uh, we uh, extended the distal femur. Uh, this was fixed with a plate. And you can see here at the end of the surgery, uh, there is a 30 degree correction. Um, so instead of the patient have 30 degree flexion contraction, it becomes fully straight. Uh, again, this was combined with distalization of the tibial tubercle. So the tibial tubercle from here, it was the the light about one inch to pull the patella down and um, uh, give the quadriceps muscle uh, more uh, power. Uh, so um, for the knee flexion contracture, you either do soft tissue release, uh, which is a lengthening of the uh, hamstring muscle, plus or minus the posterior capsule or bony procedure. The bony procedure, if the child is still growing, um, we proceed with uh, a distal uh, femur uh, uh, anterior distal femur hemiphysiodesis so that the child can grow from the posterior distal femur, extending the femur, or it can be acute distal femoral osteotomy um, with or without translation of the uh, tibial uh, tubercle. So this is one of my patients with diaplegic cerebral palsy. You can see the severe crouch gait that he has. Um, he has a severe uh, flexion of uh, the knee. Uh, this is a fixed flexion deformity. Uh, and uh, you can see here only a few weeks after surgery, even before uh, doing market physical therapy, uh, just after the extension osteotomy, um, you can see that the, the uh, knee, the gait has uh, markedly improved. Um, the flexion deformity, he's not having it. Uh, he's able to extend the knee and walk uh, much better, as you can see. And this is only a few weeks after surgery, even before uh, physical therapy. So after we talk about hip and knee, we're going to speak about foot deformities. Foot deformities and cerebral palsy um, are more complicated. It takes different uh, shape and deformities. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, common ones and the general rule to manage them because management of foot deformity in children with cerebral palsy uh, is not universal among all uh, uh, surgeons. And um, uh, the treatment of the same deformity can take uh, can be different between different uh, institutes. Uh, we'll start with bunion deformity. So if you have a, a major bunion deformity, um, uh, whether the hallux valgus or dorsal bunion, um, and it's affecting the um, uh, uh, wear, uh, the shoe wear, uh, the treatment is fusion. It's not osteotomy, uh, it's not soft tissue, it's actually fusion of the metatarsophalangeal joint. So if there is a bunion, whether it's dorsal bunion or it's hallux valgus, uh, and um, it is affecting the child shoe wear. If it's not affecting the child shoe wear, there is no treatment. If it's affecting the child shoe wear, the treatment is metatarsophalangeal fusion. So fusion between the metatarsal and the phalanx. So one of the most um, common deformities that affect the ankle in cases of cerebral palsy is equinus deformity. Equinus deformity mean that, means that the ankle is in a, in a fixed plantar uh, flexion position. So in the beginning, we start with um, uh, serial casting, meaning that we apply cast in the maximum amount of dorsiflexion possible. And then every week we repeat the serial casting till we can reach to neutral position or even few degrees of dorsiflexion. And once you reach that, you apply AFO, which is the ankle foot or sources, a brace to maintain the correction that you obtained with the serial casting and prevent the, the recurrence of equinus. So AFO brace cannot treat equinus. So if you have a patient with equinus, you cannot put an AFO to treat him because AFO cannot overcome uh, uh, the uh, equinus uh, deformity, but it can be used when the when you can reach to neutral position of the ankle to prevent uh, the redevelopment of the equinus deformity. So it can maintain the correction that you obtain <clears throat> with the serial casting, but you cannot use it to, uh, to obtain the uh, correction. So it, it maintain the correction, um, but it cannot uh, um, achieve the correction by itself. So the AFO, you have to reach to neutral uh, position and then you apply the AFO. Uh, another um, treatment option is also the Botox injection, meaning that you apply the Botox to the gastrocnemius muscle. Um, and we talk about uh, Botox um, uh, uh, earlier in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, so the Botox will cause relaxation and, uh, of the spasticity that this patient has, and it will allow you to um, uh, uh, obtain uh, the correction easy, uh, easier with the serial cast. So um, the Botox injection uh, can be applied 
um, um, before the serial casting um, to relax the gastrocnemial muscle and be able to obtain uh, the correction uh, easier with the serial casting. So if there is failure of non-surgical treatment, if you cannot obtain your correction using the serial cast, you, um, you will have to do a, a Achilles tendon lengthening. Um, in most cases, we prefer to do gastrocnemius recession um, because over lengthening can result in a calcaneus deformity, meaning the reverse of the equinus deformity. The child will have dorsiflexion of the uh, uh, ankle. Uh, so you want to uh, avoid that, uh, especially in patients with cerebral palsy. So you will stay away from Z lengthening. You will stay away from working at the level of the um, uh, tendon in this area, very distal, by doing the Z Z lengthening because that can easily uh, lead to over correction and over lengthening of the Achilles tendon. So um, it's better to work um, more, pro uh, slightly more proximal, either um, the, the Vulpius or the Strier. And these two, at the, uh, we call it gastrocnemius recession, uh, meaning that we will do a um, recession at the musculotendinous junction. Uh, whether it's a Strier or Vulpius, uh, these both um, uh, work on the gastro and the mus musculotendinous junction uh, and it will allow the recession of the muscle uh, um, which um, have much less chance of overcorrection. The strier is a slightly more proximal level than the vulpius. Um, uh, uh, there is also uh, the Bowman technique in which uh, it works on the, uh, uh, the uh, anterior uh, fascia of the um, uh, gastrocnemius muscle. Um, uh, it obtains um, much less correction than the strier and vulpius. Uh, so again, um, the equinus deformity, if it fails the non-surgical uh, treatment, the treatment is surgery with Achilles tendon, you try to stay away from Z lengthening uh, or, or working on the Achilles tendon at the most distal level because it can lead to overcorrection. Uh, most of the surgeon will do either Strier or Volpius at the musculotendinous junction, allowing the, uh, the recession and um, the controlled lengthening of the muscle. So now after we talked about uh, bunion and equinus, let's talk about flexible equinovarus deformity. Some kids with cerebral palsy will have flexible equinovarus, meaning that the kid, when he walks, he walks um, uh, on the outer surface of the foot and on the anterior surface of the foot, um, and the deformity is more or less flexible. So um, uh, if uh, it's not corrected with non-operative measures like a brace, uh, the next step would be uh, surgical, and the surgery in this case is either uh, a, a release and lengthening of the posterior tibial tendon or split transfer of the posterior tibial tendon. Uh, so um, half of the posterior tibial tendon is transferred to the anterior surface of the foot uh, to decrease the equinus pull and to equalize the uh, uh, varus pull. So flexible equinovarus deformity, uh, if not uh, controlled by non-surgical options, uh, the treatment is either release or split transfer of the posterior tibial tendon. Now let's talk about varus deformity. Um, if it's a pure varus deformity, uh, it can be um, uh, due to overactivity of either tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior. Uh, EMG can help uh, in these cases to identify uh, which muscle is responsible. So um, if uh, the orthopedic surgeon has uh, the availability of gait lab, that uh, can give him a hint which muscle to uh, do the split transfer. Um, uh, if not, um, uh, one of the things that you can do is if it's um, a pure hind foot varus deformity or if it's associated with mild equinus, usually the treatment is posterior tibial tendon uh, split, posterior tibial tendon transfer, so half of it is transferred to the anterior. Um, if it's uh, um, uh, uh, various deformity of the hind foot associated with uh, midfoot and forefoot um, uh, varus, um, it uh, may be uh, treated with a split transfer of the tibialis anterior. So if the patient has a severe vulgus deformity not controlled with a bracing, um, the treatment is calcaneal lengthening. Um, uh, however, calcaneal lengthening by itself is usually not enough for cerebral palsy. So you'll go for medial column fusion. The medial column is the telonavicular um, uh, plus or minus navicular cuneiform uh, to uh, keep the foot corrected. And you can also add soft tissue procedure like tightening of the medial um, the side muscles, the tibialis posterior muscle, and release of the lateral side muscle, the peroneus brevis muscle.
Now let's uh, shift gears and go to the upper extremity. So hand deformities in cerebral palsy. Uh, most common is flexion deformity of the wrist with ulnar deviation and flexion deformity of the fingers. Uh, regarding the thumb, it's abduction deformity of the thumb. So for the wrist, it's flexion deformity um, with ulnar deviation. Um, for the fingers, flexion deformity. And uh, for the thumb, it's abduction uh, deformity. As you can see here, and this is one of my uh, patients here. So we have flexion deformity of the wrist, flexion deformity, uh, flexion deformity of the wrist, flexion deformity of the finger, um, ulnar deviation, as you can see here also, and abduction of the thumb. Um, treatment, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, early treatment is by uh, therapy, stretching, bracing, uh, Botox injection of the spastic muscle. Um, uh, if the condition is late, uh, muscle release, um, uh, uh, you can release the whole flexor pronator mass. Um, transfer, one of the most common transfer in uh, cerebral palsy is FCU, the flexor carpi ulnaris to e uh, ECRB, extensor carpi radialis brevis. Um, this uh, flexor carpi ulnaris um, release will uh, decrease the flexion and ulnar deviation and when you transfer to the extensor carpi radialis um, it will um, uh, uh, add some extension moment uh, and also some radial deviation moment also it has some um, uh, effect on decreasing uh, pronation which most kids have with cerebral palsy um, if the condition is really very severe, very rigid, uh, you can go to wrist fusion. And also in, with wrist fusion, if you uh, decrease um, the length of the wrist, basically by removing the proximal row, you will improve the flexion deformity of the fingers because now the muscles um, uh, is uh, going through a smaller area, so it will be relatively lengthened. So it will help with the flexion deformity of the hand. So the treatment early is bracing, um, uh, Botox injection, stretching, late, um, uh, if, it, if it's correctable, you can use the transfer. The most common transfer is FCU, T E C R B, or you can do muscle release, the flexopronator muscle release, um, or, um, or if it's really rigid, you can do wrist fusion. You can combine wrist fusion with proximal row carpectomy to help the finger uh, flexion deformity. So fractures in cerebral palsy is common, are common. Uh, um, why? Because these patients all have uh, uh, osteoporosis from the non-weight bearing, and most of them are on anti-seizure medication. Anti-seizure medication um, act as a anti-vitamin D, and uh, it causes weakness in the structure of the bone. So uh, fractures are common. This is the X-ray that I showed you um, a few weeks down the road while the uh, caregiver was transferring the patient. The the leg was caught in the bed and the patient ended with fractured distal femur that was fixed. So um, uh, uh, these patients get um, re multiple repeated fractures uh, from their uh, osteoporosis. Um, however, you really need to think in non-accidental trauma. Uh, the other name for it is child abuse. Why? Because these patients have developmental delay and we know that developmental delay is risk for non-accidental trauma. I'd like to thank you for listening to the lecture and I hope this lecture will help you in your uh, both uh, clinical work and exam.